regard to IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. I'm going to do a little segment here on dairy in a moment, but dairy has often been vilified for activating IGF-1, but I would challenge vegan and vegetarians to show me what their levels of IGF-1 are. I've shown my blood work multiple times and my IGF-1 remains below the average of the human population, often by half or a full standard deviation. So here I am, a 45-year-old male who is exercising, not fearing mTOR with my exercise, who's getting out in the sun, who's eating a lot of meat and organs, either fresh or desiccated like I get from hardened soil. I'm eating fruit and honey and maple syrup and a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of dairy. My IGF-1 should be through the roof, right? Not really. Consistent overactivation of IGF-1 doesn't come from foods that signal abundance to our bodies like meat and organs and dairy. It comes from insulin resistance. And that's what these longevity specialists, these biogerontologists don't understand. Perhaps they need to read more of the research. How do you avoid insulin resistance? Don't overactivate cortisol. Don't have a damaged gut. And don't eat polyunsaturated fatty acids, especially in seed oils. So now the authors go after milk. They say milk, a strong stimulator of aging pathways like mTOR, increases mortality and accelerates aging. Hmm. All of the references they list are things like this, looking at mechanistic hypotheses for a pathogenic role of persistent milk signaling of the mTOR complex of mTOR, uh, driven by type 2 diabetes. Well, I guess they're suggesting that milk is going to drive diabetes or aging or cardiovascular disease, and I'm not sure how they arrive at that conclusion when there are multiple other studies to suggest the opposite. I won't go through all of these because it would take a long time, but I'll do a whole podcast on dairy in the future. Here's just one or two dairy consumption and patterns of mortality among Australian adults. Overall intake of dairy products was not associated with mortality. Possible beneficial association between intake of full fat dairy and cardiovascular mortality needs further assessment and confirmation. So I, again, I, I don't really understand how the authors of this article can be so blatantly ignorant of the articles that contradict what they are claiming and the evolutionary context of these things. The Maasai are a group that drinks tons of dairy and lots of blood, and they are pretty free of chronic disease, and they don't look very excessively aged to me. The relationship between high-fat dairy consumption and obesity, cardiovascular, and metabolic disease the observational evidence does not support the hypothesis that dairy fat or high fat dairy foods contribute to obesity or cardiometabolic risk. It suggests that high fat dairy consumption within typical dietary patterns is inversely associated with obesity, meaning the more dairy that is high fat dairy, the lower the risk of obesity, which means eat your butter, eat your full fat dairy, eat your raw whole milk, and eat your cheese. So, again, milk haters, beware, I am coming for you. There's also plenty of good evidence that kids who drink full fat milk are at less of a risk of obesity. So very clear pattern that appears to be beneficial for humans with dairy. And again, I've had a lot of dairy in my diet recently and I've shown my blood work. I would challenge vegans and vegetarians to show me that their IGF-1 is lower than mine. So any podcast looking to debunk plant-based arguments and longevity arguments would be incomplete without consideration of this paper from Walter Longo. Um, it is an epidemiology study claiming that low protein intake is associated with a major reduction in IGF-1 cancer and overall mortality in the 65 and younger, but not older population. If we just pause for a moment, is it possible that there's some healthy user bias here or some unhealthy user bias here? Because I believe what's happening in the study is that there is healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias, meaning that the people who are eating more protein are doing more unhealthy behaviors. It is impossible to tease these two things out. And the people that are eating less protein are doing more healthy behaviors. And that is why we see a reduction in cancer and mortality less than 65. But I also believe that meat and protein is so important for the human organism that once we get past 65, the unhealthy user bias and the healthy user bias are completely wiped off the map and even these researchers are forced to admit that over 65, you better not limit protein. So let's just get this straight. These are longevity researchers telling us that eating a low protein diet will increase our longevity. But once you make it to 65, eating a low protein diet will decrease your longevity. That makes a lot of sense to me. 
It makes absolutely no sense. It makes absolutely no sense, guys. Don't fall for this. This is typical epidemiology being wielded in a very unfortunate way. And even further, it's unfortunate that outlets like National Geographic pick up articles like this behind the news, why a high protein diet in middle age may increase the risk of death. Oh yeah, because you don't, you don't wanna eat a high protein diet when you're young and you're doing dangerous stuff like jumping in the pools and swimming in rivers and jumping off waterfalls and getting smashed on the head by waves. You just wanna eat a, a high protein diet when you're older. This is the type of stuff that happens in the longevity community, guys. I don't get it, it drives me wild. So again, we're back to the dangers of epidemiology. And since I love bashing polyunsaturated fatty acids, I wanted to point out this epidemiology study, which is quite interesting. Margarine intake and the subsequent coronary heart disease risk in men. If you look in the data in this study, what the researchers found was that the people who ate more margarine had a higher rate of cardiovascular disease. No surprise there because I'm not a fan of polyunsaturated fatty acids and margarine in general. But what was very interesting here was that unhealthy user bias was clearly at play, but it didn't actually confound the results because the people who ate less margarine, the people that were not listening to mainstream health advice were people who were smoking more, drinking more, and had more unhealthy behaviors. This is unhealthy user bias. But in this study, the results, the dangers of the margarine were so strong that it outweighed all of those un other unhealthy behaviors they were doing. This meant that the healthy user bias of the margarine group was also at play. The people who ate more margarine were the people listening to mainstream health advice in the early 60s and 70s, and they were smoking less, drinking less. This is what's going on here. And we see this clearly illustrated. The people that listen to mainstream health advice eat less meat, and they drink less, and they smoke less. And the people that eat more meat, drink more, smoke more. And when was the last time you went to a barbecue and ate just plain meat? Well, listeners of this podcast might've done that, but most people in America, because we're talking about the Western world here and most of this research, are going to barbecues and they're eating meat with sugar in it that may be high fructose corn syrup with seed oils. They're eating coleslaw with mayonnaise with high fructose corn syrup and seed oils. They're eating brownies with refined flours. So how many people do you know that are rebels, that don't listen to health advice, that just eat meat with nothing else, no junk food? And again, I'm talking about mainstream Westernized Americans, not health conscious people making a distinct choice to eat a carnivore or animal based diet. And as we mentioned earlier, mTOR, not something that we necessarily want to avoid triggering, not something that we can avoid triggering if we're going to eat any food or do any sort of movement. And then these longevity proponents never discuss that there is an immunological trade off to an mTOR deficiency. That if you limit mTOR or if you knock out mTOR or if someone developed a drug that blocks mTOR, like rapamycin, there are immunologic trade-offs leading to increased infections with microbacterial infections like tuberculosis. So I have major concerns that this rapamycin craze will lead to increased tuberculosis, increased pulmonary infections, increased infections overall, because guess what? If you don't tell your body that you're thriving, if you don't give your body an abundance signal with protein, specifically the amino acid leucine, carbohydrates, the postprandial insulin signal, your immune system may suffer. Why would we think that we're smarter than hundreds of thousands of years of evolution and that we should do something different than our ancestors have done for hundreds of thousands of years? Because they look pretty healthy to me and Western medicine is completely ignorant to this. I don't understand why anthropology is not taught in medical schools. That would, I think, create so much dissension among the medical students when they realize that there are still free living populations of humans on this earth that are free from chronic diseases as we know them today, that are rampant in our population. There are humans living on this earth that are free from obesity, that are free from diabetes, that are free from cardiovascular disease, that are free from autoimmunity, cancer, depression, dementia, et cetera. And guess what? <laughs> These humans eat meat and organs and lots of animal fat and a good amount of carbohydrates because they'll eat honey anytime they can get it. I'm talking about the Hadza, the Ikung, the Yanomono in Brazil. So many populations around the globe illustrate this. This is a cognitive dissonance that would explode many of the mind of a medical student.